on last year's Max Adobe Demo Illustrator for the iPad. We only got a small glimpse of it and it was still a work in progress, but it was very exciting to see that a tablet version of the app was actively being worked on. Fast forward over one year later and I'm happy to say it's finally here. Illustrator on the iPad is a reality. I can almost hear what you're thinking. Is it any good? The short answer is yes, but let's dive in and see things in more detail. Of course, the first thing I tried when I got my hands on the app was to load a complex file to test out the limitations. This here is a project that is not only complex, but it's also using a lot of different uh, Illustrator features. First off, it has a ton of vectors, so it's perfect to test out the performance of the app and the iPad's hardware. But performance aside, this scene is also perfect to test out which features are currently supported. For example, the project is using transparency masks to create the hand-drawn organic look. Without the masks, the shapes are just plain colored vectors. Furthermore, the transparency masks are using one more Illustrator feature, patterns, which we can find in the swatches library. And that is how the hand-drawn look is achieved. By changing the patterns, we can get a different look. Finally, the file is making use of multiple layers, so it'll be interesting to also see how these are handled. So the moment of truth. Let's see what happens when we load up this file on the iPad. <laughs> this first message is not so encouraging, but the file seems to load up correctly and nothing seems to be missing. So far, so good. It's worth noting here how fast the file loaded up, but let's test out the performance. It's a little bit stuttery zooming in and out, and sometimes it takes a second to catch up, but to be honest, I can live with that. It's incredible that we can load up a file like this one, let alone be able to work with it. All the layers seem to be here, and of course we can enable and disable them. Hiding and unhiding layers feels quite fast. I also see the Greek used on the layer names are also properly preserved, which means that languages are handled correctly. Now let's check how the file performs when we start making adjustments. Color adjustments seem to work absolutely fine and the changes feel snappy. Moving the object to a different order also feels fast. And the same goes when moving things around. There's no delay there, it looks like most of the performance issues have to do with the navigation. Everything else feels solid. Now let's check if the features used on the file are supported. Unfortunately, the patterns cannot be accessed. If we go to our swatches here, the patterns are not showing up at all. They are properly applied to the object, which is great, but there's no way to change them. But even if they were visible in the library, we wouldn't be able to adjust them since there's no way to access the transparency masks on the objects. We can enable and disable the object, but the option to access the transparency mask is missing. I keep forgetting, but I think it's worth noting that we're still talking about the first iteration of the app, so it's kinda expected that not everything will be there from the get-go. I would absolutely love it if everything was there, but I think we need to lower a little bit our expectations. It's very encouraging though to see that even if we cannot have direct access to some of the features, the file is displaying everything correctly, and nothing gets corrupted in the process. Now let's see another typical example, a layout for a web page. This is a much easier example to handle for both the iPad and the app, but we will still try to test out a couple more features. The first thing I want to try out is using linked files. I absolutely hate using embedded images. It makes for unnecessarily large files, especially when saving multiple iterations of the project. To differentiate a little bit, I'll have some images as links and others as embedded. The last thing I want to test out is the ability to uh, edit the appearance of an object. It's something I often use and in this case I'm using it to create dynamic buttons. The effect is achieved by applying two fills. One is used for the color of the text and the other one is converted with the use of an effect into a rectangle. Now when I change the text, the rectangle underneath changes dynamically. Now let's see what happens when we open up the file on the iPad. Unfortunately, we get the familiar dialogue once more and the linked files are not visible. It's reassuring to see though that when we switch to outline mode, the image and the mask around the image is preserved. So the elements are still there, they're just being ignored for now. 
The embedded files, of course, are displayed without any issues. To circumvent the missing images, we can easily create some placeholders based on the masks in the outline mode. So we can definitely continue working with a file, it's just that we need to find a workaround to make it work. Now let's see how well our buttons work. I did not expect it would be possible, but we can actually edit the text and the rectangle surrounding the text updates accordingly. That shows that there's already partial support for the appearance panel. Unfortunately though, we don't have any access to the settings of the appearance, so at the moment we cannot change the color of the text because we cannot access the fill color used for the text. But we can access the fill color of the rectangle underneath. When it comes to changing the padding of the rectangle though, we're once again limited. We can only do that on the desktop. So what does all this tell us? It's definitely possible to design something from beginning to end on the iPad, and the app is robust enough to load complex files. You need to be aware though that some more advanced features are not yet fully supported. They will display properly most of the times, but they won't be editable. The features I mentioned before are not the only ones uh, missing, so if you're relying heavily on them, you need to find ways to get around them. For example, symbols. If they are used on the project, they will be displayed properly, but we won't be able to access the library of our symbols or edit them in any way. We can place them, move them around and copy them, but they won't be editable. Your mileage will uh, vary also with some uh, smaller features as well, like aligning objects based on a key object. On the desktop, it's just a matter of a second click to define the key object, but on the iPad, the feature is not there yet or at least I did not find a way to do that. If you're a heavy Illustrator user, you need to be prepared that you will hit these limitations regularly. But at the same time, I think that what was achieved for the very first iteration is quite commendable. The app, of course, supports a keyboard and a mouse, and when you do so, it feels like using the desktop version of Illustrator, but on a tiny laptop. It almost feels like you're getting the full desktop experience. And of course, a desktop experience wouldn't be complete without keyboard shortcuts. Something other vector apps either completely ignore or they partially support. In the case of Illustrator for the iPad, most of the important keyboard shortcuts are here. We can hide, unhide, and lock objects. We can switch between the tools with the keys we're used to. We can enable artboards the same way we do on the desktop, and so on and so forth. The shortcuts are exactly the same, so if you know Illustrator's shortcuts, you will immediately know how to use the iPad version of Illustrator. But there's always a but. Not all of the important shortcuts are here. In fact, there's quite a big selection of keys missing. For example, the ability to change the nudging value. We can hit Command-K like we do on the desktop to get to the general preferences, but there's no field to set the movement increments. So, even though we can use the arrow keys to move the object around, we cannot use our own value. We're stuck with the app's own default value. Also, simple shortcuts like holding down the spacebar to pan around the document is not working. We need to pan around with our fingers. Holding down the I key to quickly grab a color or the appearance of an object won't work. On the desktop, grabbing a color is just a split second thing. On the iPad, it's a tedious process. We need to click on the color swatch, get the color picker, and then pick the color we need. Enabling the grid with a key combination like on the desktop is just not possible for now. There's also no quick way to alter the position and scale of an object. On the desktop, it's just a matter of pressing enter and then moving or scaling the object in the amount needed. On the iPad, we need to manually do it on this panel here. And since there are no math operations, we cannot add to the already existing value. I can go on and on about these small things, but you get the point. We're very close to having an awesome tablet version of the app, but because of these omissions, the experience feels a little bit compromised. We're insanely close though. I think in the next couple of versions, the experience will be vastly improved. At least, <laughs> I hope. Shortcomings aside, I think Illustrator for the iPad has a really solid version 1 release. It feels great using the app we know and love on the iPad. I had some truly magical moments when using the app, especially when using most of the tools that were reimagined so they would work better on a tablet. The pattern tool feels absolutely great, and it's a joy to use on the iPad. The same goes for the blob brush. It works really nicely, and you basically don't want to use the Boolean operations ever again. 
<laughs> the program also feels fast and responsive, and most importantly, if you want to, you can produce a natural piece of work on the iPad. That is absolutely amazing if you think about it. A decade ago, that would sound ridiculous to even say out loud. But now we're at a stage where a tablet can totally replace a computer. You want to create a logo? You can do that without a hitch. It actually feels more natural to do so on the iPad. You can draw a rough shape with a pencil and then refine it with all the available tools in Illustrator. You want to create an illustration or a layout for a website? You can do that as well. You want to access your old Illustrator files sitting on your NAS or an external hard drive? Absolutely doable. We're at a point where we can pick and choose the platform we want to work on based on the situation at that given point. You're on the road, you can quickly design something on your iPad and then move that on the desktop version of Illustrator and continue from there. Moving from one platform to the other works flawlessly. This amount of freedom is truly amazing. Of course, there are still things that Adobe needs to work on. Thankfully, the team working on the app is very responsive and very receptive to feedback, so I'm sure we will soon get all of these things missing. And when that happens, I think there won't be any reason to use any other vector app on the iPad. It's that good. Anyway, that's it for now. Let me know what else you want to know about the app and I'll do my best to answer things in the comments below. I might even consider doing another video if the questions are too complex to answer in the comments. Give it a try and let me know what you think. Take care and I'll see you on the next one.